The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as it had been told them. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord you bow your heads with me in prayer, please. Gracious Lord, we thank you for this wonderful, powerful feast day of the Lord that you have created and allowed us to share. And this, this evening, Lord Jesus, would you take our minds and think through them? Take my lips and speak through them? Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for your son, Jesus. Take our wills and put them in sub submission to yours. In Jesus Christ's holy and blessed name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Well, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, and it is so good to see all of you here, some of you for the first time, some of you for the first time in a while, from east and west, north and south, as my father used to say. If you didn't notice, it's like 12 degrees outside and I'm sweating, so I opened, I opened my window. If anybody gets cold, let me know. Uh, a couple things, uh, for those of you out there, sorry about the hiccup with Facebook, uh, I believe it's back on. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, and if you are missing a candle or a bulletin, it's because we just didn't think that this many people would show up in this weather. So praise be to God for that. Uh, borrow from your neighbors. Um, this last week or two, I was reading an article by a man I've been reading for the last two years since about the middle of the pandemic. His name is Paul Kingsnorth. And he's a writer who has got an amazing history and he's become a Christian and he's writing this kind of cultural history of where we've come the last 300, 400 years, where we are and where he thinks we're going. And recently he took a holiday, he's English, but he lives in Ireland. That's a smart move. Um, and he went to uh, France with his family for, for a holiday and they were at some of the art shows and art museums there. And he came upon a kind of epiphany. He realized as he was walking through these museums that there were so many, if not almost all of the paintings of human beings over the last three or 400 years, they all had a common theme. They all had this kind of aspect of humans needing help. He went through the list of all these famous paintings and he was like, help this, help that, help that, save this. He was like, I couldn't believe it until I stepped back and I realized, you know what? Human beings really do need a lot of help. I'd like to read you a poem tonight, well, sort of a poem. <clears throat> Maybe you've heard this. I need somebody help, not just anybody. I'm trying not to sing it. Help, you know I need someone help. So much younger than today, 
I never needed anybody's help in any way. But now these days are gone. I'm not so self-assured. Now I find I've changed my mind and opened up the doors. Help me if you can, I'm feeling down. And I do appreciate you being around. Help me get my feet back on the ground. Won't you please, please help me? Lennon and McCartney were not stupid, were they? They understood it. This is obviously some individual story about the need for help, but it speaks to that human condition. If you think about it, from that first cry of a baby, if you could translate it, it would probably be, help, what am I doing here? Help, get me food. Help, get me something warm. And then we switch to the other end. I just recently visited my mother in Pittsburgh who is on a seven or eight scale to 10 being the worst in dementia. Those of you who've been through this and seen it, it's not a fun picture. She needs help doing just about everything. Eating, changing clothes, walking sometimes, changing herself from birth to death. You ever think about that? And everything in between. Every single one of you in here has asked for help or asked somebody to save you in the last week or month. Some of us, multiple times. Doesn't matter if you're one day or a hundred years, it's a weird human condition. And especially for those of us who have noticed the power and the technology and the wisdom that human beings now behold and carry with us, not just in our cell phones, the science and technology to do amazing things, fly to the moon. We're going to apparently fly to Mars someday. All the things we've created, and yet we continue to seek and need help. Have you ever thought about how strange that is? I'm going to read you another poem, sort of. <clears throat> this one you may be a little less known. If blood will flow and flesh and steel are one, dying in the color of the evening sun. Tomorrow's rain will wash the stains away, but something in our minds will always stay. Perhaps this final act was meant to clinch a lifetime's argument that nothing comes from violence and nothing ever could. For all those born beneath an angry star, lest we forget how fragile we are. On and on the rain will fall like tears from a star, like tears from a star. On and on the rain will say how fragile we are, how fragile we are. Anybody? Sting. Yes! That's from Sting's album, uh, An Englishman in New York. Sting, who was the lead singer of the police. Thank you for a couple of you recognizing that one is a little less easy to sing than help. But when I was prepping for this, those songs attacked my head, and I said, help, I'm fragile, and I thought about it. How often we ask for help, how often we need to be saved in this world, how fragile we are. Now, Sting is talking about some of the terrible things that happened in the Central America revolutionary wars in the 80s, the war and destruction and the weaponry that was destroying bodies. But do you ever think about how fragile you really are? There are a thousand things in this room right now that could injure you, and that's just our body. Can you, I mean, right? I could hit at my head on anything in here, on one of your heads. I won't do that. We are fragile creatures, and that's just our bodies. Not to mention the things that really we seek help and salvation for, our minds and our hearts and our souls. Have you ever thought about that? I don't want this to be a pessimistic sermon. It's clearly not. It's Christmas. And recognize that in the midst of that seeking help and looking to be saved as we have that feeling. I don't know about you, but I would bet most of you, if not all of you also, while you recognize the need for help and salvation, you also recognize that there's that stirring in your heart of hope, right? Somebody is going to save me. Somebody is going to help me, right? You've asked for help and saving a thousand times in your life, and 90 some percent, hopefully, somebody's done it. And there's that ever-inherent part of your body and mind and soul that says, no, I will cry out for help and somebody will save me. That's a wonderful thing. It's interesting, though, that we live in a world, in a, in a nation, where there are cities where they will teach you, in, in, as especially women in the culture going out at night, if something happens to you, don't cry for help. What do you cry for instead? Fire. 
Because help, people aren't going to run to you. You cry fire, and they come running. By the way, that's from a movie. Anybody who knows it, tell me afterward. Right? That's part of the problem. It's not only that we can't get help ourselves, but that the world is becoming a world in which people don't want to help us. People don't want to save us, increasingly. And so we're left with that hope, though, aren't we? I don't know about you, but I assume in my life, maybe I am blessed, maybe I am special and privileged, whatever, I have always been helped to most extent. And most of you have, because you're here tonight. That is that hope, though. That hope that kind of transcends my body and my mind and soul. I would suggest to you tonight that that hope to be helped and saved exists outside of our cultures and our minds and our hearts. It comes from somewhere else. Because where else could it come from? If there comes a point in your life, and there will, and there has, where nobody can help you, there will come a time for each one of us, won't there? There will come those moments, that moment of darkness, that moment of despair, that moment of brokenness. All of us will come to the tunnel. I'm not going to say it in any other way because there are children here tonight. It's Christmas. I don't want to say the D word. But when you get there, you know something, right? Nobody will help you. Nobody can help you. You can't even help yourself. And yet that stirring in your heart, it's like you can smell it, but you can't see it. You can see it, but you can't hear it. You know that there is help and salvation. You just can't explain it. And that explanation has to come from somewhere. And since it can't come from here because we're all part of that problem, where do you think it's going to come from? Hint, hint. I don't know if some of you know how movies and plays work. Some of you have studied this. Do you ever know this? Movies and plays follow a very similar pattern. Three acts. You know this? The first stage, the first act is the setting up characters, so you get to know them. What's stage two? There's a problem. And what's stage three? Solution. Think about every one of your favorite movies. Get to know them. Here's the problem. Everything gets solved. Think about the movies and the plays. It happens all the time. Why does it happen? It's a human condition. But Hollywood and the novel writers for the last 500, 1,000 years didn't come up with that pattern, did they? We can find it somewhere else. Hint, hint. The Bible. The Bible, in addition to every story of every person in there which follows that pattern, here's so-and-so. Here's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Here comes their problem. And here comes what? their solution. But did you ever notice this? The entire Bible in itself is a three-act play, just in a, albeit, different mode. Did you ever think about this? You get one page for the setup. God created us in his image. We are to be with him in the garden, blessed for all time and eternity. That's, that's the beginning, stage one, page one. Uh-oh. Page two, there's a problem. We decided we didn't want to do that. We didn't want to be there. And God's like, see you later. Two pages. You ever notice how long the Bible is? <laughs> Some of you have read the whole thing. The other 1,000, 1,500 pages, what is it? It's the solution. It's the solution to the problem on page two to get back to page one. For there to be a solution that exists outside of the human condition of fragility the human condition of needing help and salvation, that inherent knowledge inside of you that you can smell but can't see, you, can't, you can see but you can't hear it, you know it's there. You know somebody's going to reach down and help you. And when they don't, you know that there's something still out there has to come from somewhere. And the Bible gives us to you the story of salvation. But in order for that to happen, God has to come to you first. And so... Unto us, a child is born. The reading from Isaiah today is a beautiful opening up of the solution of the story. Unto us, unto you and me and everybody who has come before and everybody who comes after, a child is born. This child who has come and he is ready to do some business. Isaiah lays it out, and he says, here's the thing. If you read the beginning half of the passage tonight, you can look at it now or later. What's he talking about? 
He's talking about all those moments when you were looking for help, when you were looking to be saved. He talks about darkness. He talks about death. There's an allusion to oppression and slavery. It's the worst despair and loneliness in your life. And God says, I got you. I know you're fragile. I know you need help. I know you need salvation. Guess what? I'm coming for you. I'm going to send my son, Jesus, the Messiah. And Isaiah's like, I'm not going to just give you his name. I'm going to give you his attributes, his power. And he lists these wonderful titles. But they're not just titles. These are conditions of the being of the Messiah who is also God. Wonderful counselor, almighty God, eternal father, prince of peace. Do you hear these words? Do you understand what lies behind them? That itch you have, that thing you can smell but you can't see, that see, thing you can see and can't hear, it exists within the Messiah himself. Wonderful counselor. What does he do? He counsels. Thanks, Charlie. He leads, he guides, he teaches. Who does he teach? Everybody. What does he teach? He teaches truth. And he's wonderful to do it. He's gracious to do it. And who is this wonderful counselor but almighty God? And what is this almighty God? This means he is divine. The Messiah is not just some guy who comes in with some nice words and says, Hi, I'm Jesus. Be my friend. No, he is divine. And what kind of divinity is it? It's almighty. And this word almighty has a connotation of battle. Brothers and sisters, people who are visiting, those of you who don't know Jesus or who got him, do you realize he comes to battle for you? He comes to save you and help you and battle the forces of darkness and sin and death for you, each one of you, here and at home. But he doesn't just battle like that. He battles as what? Eternal Father. He doesn't come into your life and he's like, I got five minutes to tell you a bedtime story. I got an hour for dinner. I'm going to come for Christmas for how long are you guys here? Ten days, Greg? Yeah. No. Eternity. This is an ongoing, life-saving battle forever. And he doesn't just come as some schmo you've ever met or some guy you met at the street or some woman you met at the, the grocery store. Who does he come as? Father with a capital F. The connotation is the tender, loving care, the guardian protectionship that a father should be. And that's who he is and who he comes as. He doesn't just come battling. He's also like, I got you. I love you. I forgive you. I'm merciful. And what would you expect if a wonderful counselor, or a mighty God, eternal father, came and saved you and pulled you out of the darkness? What would you expect the first thing to be in your heart? Peace. And so he is prince of peace. Why? Because in the song that Sting wrote, Fragile, what is he talking about? Death and destruction and war. What does God do? He removes all the barriers to peace. And you hear this on and on and on and on again in Scripture. He's going to turn the weapons into plows. He's going to remove the sadness and the despair. He's going to overturn death. There's some peace there, brothers and sisters. But this isn't just peace in some fantasy world. This is peace with God. This is peace inside your hearts. This is peace in the midst of the storms. Because life is a little bumpy. Everybody knows that, right? And so he comes. Unto us, a child was born to help, to save, to love. Isaiah finishes this little kind of section, and he says this wonderful little phrase, the zeal of the hosts will do this. And what he's really saying, the translation there, is as a form of jealousy. God is jealous, not in our petty human jealousy, like, I want that. I want that. Not, no. This zealousness, this jealousy of God, this is a love that is stirred by opposition to him. And he says, if you come to me, I will love you eternally and guide you and save you. If you don't want to be with me, judgment and wrath. Why would you want to be with somebody who doesn't want to be with you? And so he says, I will fight the battle for those who want to be with me. We are a fragile species, but we are an amazing species. And have you ever seen the movie Contact? Jodie Foster, I'm not going to give the whole thing. She hears a message from space, and there's this thing, and she creates this space thing, and Okay, anyway, she ends up contacting an alien, and she goes across space and time to talk to them. And the alien comes in a human form, so she feels more comfortable. And he says this most amazing, beautiful quote, and some of you have seen this and heard it. He says, you're an interesting species. 
You're, inc you're capable of incredible dreams and terrible nightmares. Isn't that the truth? Because each day we wake up and we walk into the darkness, in those moments of loneliness and despair, in the moments when we're crying out for help, for food, for love, for forgiveness, for mercy, for whatever it is, there is still the stirring of that which we can smell but not see, see but we can't hear. There is that eternal hope that you can be saved, you can be helped. But there has to be one outside of the system. There has to be somebody who is not really, truly, only human who can do that. And that, my brothers and sisters, is why there is a savior. That is why Jesus is both divine and human. He has to be human to experience it, but he has to be divine to help us. We are a fragile species. And God loves us so much that he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to be with us. Emmanuel, God is with us. To teach us, wonderful counselor. To fight for us, almighty God. To walk with us unto ages of ages, eternal father. And to bring us peace and joy and mercy. Prince of peace. And tonight is the night we celebrate that. Tonight we celebrate knowing that the call inside of your heart that you've always been seeking, that want of help, that need for salvation exists. And it is our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ that takes us from those 1,500 pages of solution back to page one at the beginning and says, this is where you belong, my brothers and sisters. Redeemed, forgiven, loved into your creative, intentive purpose, which is to walk with me today today tomorrow unto ages of ages but first he had to come and so unto us a child was born the lord the messiah jesus merry christmas and to be god the glory forever and ever amen, amen.